Thank you very much to all of our performers. Could we have another round of applause for all of them? Now, and now we have the judges scoring bit. So while the judges are um, discussing among themselves and following the directions on how they're going to do their um, final tallying, um, I invite you to, again, enjoy the buffet, go up into that back room and make some bids because y'all have been glued to your seats while we listen to the musicians and that was awesome. Um, make some bids up there, um, or don't, it's okay. Uh, we've had a good afternoon and then when the judges have uh, come up with their um, results, I will come back and make some announcement. Um, I, Think, John Corman. Are you talking now? Okay. Are Are you going to talk now? Okay. So, Swanee River Keeper John Quarterman, um, he is our staff person. Um, he's also the president of our board of directors, um, and he's going to talk a little bit about advocacy. Howdy, and thanks for coming. Uh, yeah, she asked a question about one of the criteria on the judge's score sheet. So I thought I'd better answer the judge's question. Okay, so, uh, y'all singers, you're way faster than we thought. But don't worry, as you may recall, we asked whoever's the winner, please be prepared to play again. So there will be more music at the end. Uh, you can play the same song and you can play more songs. And if you don't want to play more than one song, I bet somebody else can want to play as well. Alright. So you've already heard about outings and water trails. These are kind of fun things that we do. We have at least one outing a month and we really like doing that. Uh, we had one this morning, which remind us not to do that again. Just get to one right before another event because people on the outing haven't shown up yet. <laughs> okay, so um, we do a bunch of other things that are more in the way of advocacy because the whole point of a river keeper is to try to keep the waters fishable, drinkable, swimmable. Okay, I don't recommend drinking this morning, but we are trying to keep the well water drinkable at least. And there's all sorts of things going on that most people don't know about. Um, we just went to, Gretchen and I went to the annual, it's going to be over two years now, but it's been annual Waterkeeper Alliance conference. And there's more than 350 waterkeepers now throughout the world. They came from everywhere, from Kenya to Nepal. And i got to say, compared to the stories I hear them telling, we are in a really fortunate situation here. Because, for example, all the ones from Africa and Asia, every single one said their biggest problem is plastics. Plastics in their rivers, plastics everywhere. And, okay, we do cleanups, we find some straws and bottles, but it's nothing like what they're doing. So, yeah, we recommend, you know, if you're going to use straws, use biodegradable ones, but we're way fortunate compared to a lot of places. We're also fortunate uh, compared to, for example, Black Warrior Riverkeeper over in Alabama. They had to fight off a huge coal mine that was going to be upstream from the water intake from Birmingham. They won, unfortunately. We don't have any coal mines in our watersheds. We do have coal ash, though, which most people don't know. In the landfill right here in Lyons County, there's coal ash from both TVA in Tennessee and Jacksonville. Coal ash, it's what's left after you burn the coal. And it's, yeah, it's kind of nasty stuff. It's got arsenic and all sorts of things in it. It's cancer causing. And um, the TVA coal ash, you may remember, I guess it was about five years ago, that it was contained in a pond and the dam broke in a flood. And then they shipped it places like five different landfills in South Georgia, including this one. The Jacksonville coal ash just goes, well, they want to get rid of it somewhere. And now Georgia Power is closing down coal plants, which is good, but they want to ship their coal ash somewhere. Fortunately, this landfill now says they don't want it anymore because it costs them extra to make extra lining and store. Okay, so at least that part's good. So there's coal ash. We, we've helped 
two years running to try to get the Georgia legislature to pass bills to you know, at least let us know what's going on. So far, Georgia Power has managed to stop that, but we'll keep trying. Water quality testing, you've heard a little about that. Who lives downstream from Valdosta? Okay, so you know about Valdosta's chronic sewage problem. Um, mm -hmm. Eileen, for example, on our board, she's from Live Oak, so she knows all about it. Now, i got to say a good word for Valdosta. They have not had a major spill in more than a year and a half. Yeah. Yep. And uh, the new Valdosta Utilities Director, the old one was very friendly, the new one, he's our big buddy. And believe me, if they have another one, you'll hear about it. Okay, they spent upwards of $200 million building a whole new wastewater treatment plant up the out of the floodplain and force mains and stuff like that. Okay, but they're not the only place that spills. Only a few weeks ago, Tifton, Georgia, where Brett and Dave are from, they spilled 36,000 gallons of sewage into the new river, which is upstream from the Withacoochee. And they had another smaller spill. Now, we know that, um, then they did testing upstream and downstream of the big one. And downstream, it was like off the charts, um, fecal coliform. How far down did it go? Nobody knows, because nobody else is testing. This is one reason we're doing a water quality testing program, because we want to know how far does it go. Uh, last year after Irma, tipped and spilled into the Little River upstream from Reed Bingham State Park. How far did it go? Nobody knows. And uh, equipment spilled after Irma, so did Lowndes County. So somebody needs to watch. We spent years trying to convince the state of Georgia and the state of Florida they're not going to do more than they're doing. Now, to, to be fair, the state of Florida is doing a lot of water quality monitoring, but not enough. So we got to help fill in the gaps. Okay. Um, Anybody from Union or Bradford County? How about Hamilton? There you go. So you know that phosphate mine. Okay, there's a proposal to put a phosphate mine in Union and Bradford counties. Now, Union County has been real good about saying, uh, you know, they're not going to do it. They actually changed their comprehensive plan and the land development regulations to make it much harder. Bradford County, um, they haven't proposed doing anything like that. They've hired a consultant to evaluate a permit. And uh, we already know what phosphate mines look like because of the one in Hamilton County. Uh, does everybody know about White Sulphur Springs, which was one of the first tourist attractions in Florida? It's dry now. The phosphate mines said they had nothing to do with that. Maybe they're right, but why risk it again? So, um, for example, uh, recently I sent a letter to Gilchrist County. Why them? They're considering writing a letter in opposition to the mine to Union and Bradford County. That's Columbia and Alachua have already done. So this is another kind of thing we're involved in. Uh, somebody earlier mentioned, uh, feel free to ask questions. I'm just giving you the high level of views. I want to know more about any of this stuff. Um, and there's a lot about everything I'm talking about on our website. Walls.net, WALS.net, or SwaneeRiverKeeper.org goes to the same place. We're opposed to it. We're opposed to it. That's right. We're a member of Floridians Against Fracking. The very first thing you have to agree to to be a member of Floridians Against Fracking is ban it. Just ban it. That's also our position in Georgia. I don't want to go on about this one, but certain other water groups in Georgia, that's not their position. They actually helped get past the law that regulates fracking, which I don't agree with. They're tired of hearing me say that. So we're going to be pushing for trying to get a fracking ban in Georgia, too. You may wonder, why do we care in Georgia? Under our feet, there is a shale basin that goes under much of South Georgia and North Florida, including Swanee, Hamilton, Lowndes, all the way up to Tift County. So we are concerned. And if Florida ever passes a fracking ban, where do you think they're going to go next? Yeah. So yes, we're definitely against that. Um, and I'm sure there's other issues I haven't mentioned yet. Just feel free to ask.
Uh, we are largely member driven, this whole phosphate mine thing. We got drawn into that because we kept hearing people going, where's the river keeper? Where's the river keeper? So you know, I've shown up at Union and Bradford County Commission meetings, I've written letters, I've taken videos. There's actually uh, a student from the University of Berkeley, California came and did a video. It's called Phosphate Mining. And I sent him the high resolution versions of the videos I took at those meetings. You probably see some clips in there. So we're largely member driven as to what we pursue. Somebody earlier mentioned our old friend, the Sable Trail Fracked Methane Pipeline. Boo! Oh, let's hear it again. Boo! Boo. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, we contributed a lot of information to Sierra Club for that case, which they actually won against Sable Trail. You may wonder, why is the pipeline still there? Because even though Sierra Club won a case where the judges said the judges are revoking the permit, they said until the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission um, did a new environmental impact statement. Okay, FERC did that. I can show you a copy of it if you want a little laugh. Um, and then the FERC convinced the judges to delay issuing a mandate. Because while the judges did a decision, it had no effect until they issued a mandate to make it so. So FERC convinced the judges to delay issuing the mandate until after FERC issued the Supplementary Environmental Impact Statement and reinstated the permits. So then when the judges issued the mandate, it only applied to the old permit, not the new one. Right. Nonetheless, that they won it all scared the whole pipeline company. The pipeline industry press was saying things like landmark historic case. And uh, Sable Trail is going to appeal it all the way to the Supreme Court, even though the pipeline's operational. Of course, operational is, you know, is it really? Because one thing FERC requires is they have to post more than once daily how much gas is going through the pipe. Up, it's down, it's up, it's down. In January, when it was so cold, it was snowing in Florida. Most of December and January, there was no gas going through that pipe. So it riddled me this. How can that pipeline be needed? It isn't. It's all for profit for a few big corporations. But don't get me started. I could go on too long on that. The reason I brought up Sable Trail is two things. One is... Right here in Valdosta, next week, there will be jury selection Monday morning at 9 a.m. for a jury trial in a case where Sable Trail sued a landowner for eminent domain. Right here in Valdosta. The actual trial can start either that afternoon or maybe the next day, and it could last all week. So if you'd like an opportunity to come be a spectator and be seen in the courtroom, or, uh, you know, nothing really stops you being out on the street with signs, this is sort of a rare opportunity these days, but here's a protest opportunity for Sable Trail. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Valdosta, this is not at the local courthouse where, next to where the county commission meets. This is 401 North Patterson, the old federal building where the post office used to be. It's on the second floor. So, <clears throat> you want to help with that? Please, any day that's coming week probably, I will be posting updates as we get it. Um, the other thing is, another thing the pipeline's actually for is liquid natural gas export. Right. Now, FERC and Sable Trail said, no, no, you know nothing about that. No, 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 uh-uh. In fact, FERC at a uh, FERC scoping meeting about Sable Trail in Florida, I think this one was in Bell, Florida, said there are not even any applications for any Section uh, 301 LNG export operations in Florida. According to their own transcript, this was the day after they opened the docket, a FERC docket, 
for an outfit called Strom, S-T-R-O-M, as in M as in Mary, Strom Inc., which at that time wanted to export from Stark. How can they export from Stark? It's way inland. By putting it in shipping containers. Okay, and right in this docket, in the application, Strom said Section 301 permit. Nonetheless, the next day, FERC said, there are none. Nope, nope, none at all. And, you know, they repeatedly said, has no connection to save the trail. Okay, the FERC docket doesn't say that. But the FERC docket, Strom refers them to the docket for the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Fossil Energy, which very clearly says we're going to get this gas from one of the existing pipelines or save the trail. And Strom since moved to Crystal River, Florida, that's where it wants to build it now, Still says in everything that filed in the Office of Fossil Energy, um, Florida Gas Transmission or Sable Trail. So, now I wouldn't want to be mean and say for a wide. Oh, I would not want to say that. But that is what the evidence seems to indicate. Either that or they didn't know, you know, their right hand didn't know what their left hand with the docket was doing. So, what's this got to do with anything? Well, in addition to, we have members in Citrus County where Crystal River is and in Marion County next door who are busily lobbying the Citrus County Commission to stop Strom. We have also retained some attorneys in Washington, D.C. I stopped by and saw them, um, I guess that was last week, I'm kind of run, losing track of the days here. And uh, we've already raised $3,500, partly thanks to our buddies in our Santa Fe River. Um, and we're aiming for at least 10,000, 15 would be good so we can have some for expert witnesses to sue FERC about this LNG export stuff. We believe we have a very good case because in 2015, when FERC decided, they, for the five commissioners had a vote and decided not to oversee LNG export terminals unless they were basically right where ship stock. And um, there was a dissent from Commissioner Norman Bay who spelled out the case, which laws they're not following. You know, here's exactly what you're not doing. But we got a bunch of other evidence, like what I just mentioned about that transcript. So that's the thing we're doing. You getting close? I, I have a question regarding something. Can you help me with something? See if she can help you while I embarrass Sharon. Uh oh. I mentioned our Santa Fe River. And I see Sharon Higgins right there. And I know she was deeply involved in this, this songwriting contest. I am not as embarrassed to say we have shamelessly stolen this idea from our Santa Fe River. Thank you, thank you. Shamelessly. And I believe Sharon was at number seven you guys did? Yes, I like that. Yep, theirs was in March, right? Right, and it's strict. Strictly about the Santa Fe River, which is where ours says not the Santa Fe is a different context. And ours started in a restaurant. Well, there you go. So our theory is, if you know, y'all seem to like this one, and when people see the videos and go, "Oh my God, we should have been there," that it'll keep growing over the years, like your one did. You did great. I was the judge of version three. Oh, there you go. Now you guys, this is wonderful. Amazing. I would not want to be a judge. The judges are still over there deliberating. Well, one thing they wanted to clarify is what does message mean? The message of the singers? The message of the organization? And I told them I thought it meant the message of the singers, but as the judges, they can decide otherwise. That's why they're judges. You know, it looks like it's really easy. One to five on eight criteria, just add it up. That's right. You guys all had excellent songs, I thought. By the way, there was going to be a seventh one that you discovered you had a conflict. Oh well, let's be present to win. Since they're still deliberating, um, first of all, anything you want to know about. Okay, well then I'll explain a little bit about, you heard from Dave that Walls has been around since 2012. And um, I believe Gretchen mentioned that our next member meeting is July 8th at the Wood Nickel and Interperimeter here in Valdosta. 
At that point, we're going to elect a few board members. Not all the terms are up, but there's uh, four slots we're going to be electing for. If you want to be a board member, put in your application. Um, and then we're going to have the quarterly board meeting in which we always elect officers annually. We're also going to be starting something new for us. OSFR has been doing this for years, which is an advisory committee. Mm -hmm. Dave Hetzel should he choose to accept if he said he will, and should the board decide to do it, which I suspect they will, we'll leave a new chair of the new advisory committee. What's the advisory committee do? Well, people like, oh, I don't know, maybe Will Eason could be on the advisory committee. And what they would do would be provide advice. It explicitly says in the bylaw the advisory committee doesn't make any decisions. And you don't have to go to boring meetings. You don't have to be on uh, lots of email lists. But people who know people, people who can say how to do this, who to reach out to, people who know legislators in Georgia and Florida when we're trying to do things like collapse bills. So that sort of thing. If any of you want to think about being on the advisory committee, let us know. There she is. Glad you could make it. So, um, and we're doing the drawing, I think Gretchen mentioned, for the raffle kayak at the member meeting, July 8th. So the other thing I wanted to mention is, what is the relation, they're still deliberating, so I'm still talking. Um, what is the relation between these things? Why do we have two banners for what looks like two different organizations? They're not actually two different organizations. Okay, so let me do this little spiel and I'll help you. Okay, she will do this. Gretchen will do this. My shirt has a little bit of waterkeeper wise. I don't know if you've ever been on an airplane where they read the um, uh, safety lecture, but they call the person who reads the thing the singer and the person who does the demonstration the dancer. So I'll be your dancer now. <laughs> um, the relationship between the Wells Watershed Coalition and the Swanee Riverkeeper is that Swanee Riverkeeper is a one of our programs. Um, we um, have that license given to us by, well, not really given, we pay for it, um, by the Waterkeeper International. Um, that's an international organization that coordinates and um, gives territories to organizations to advocate for. So when we formed the Walls Watershed Coalition, we didn't think that we wanted to be a river keeper because what we really wanted to do was do education and um, we really wanted to talk to people about introducing them to the beauty of the rivers and to um, increase awareness and that kind of thing. And we didn't necessarily want to be police and it seemed like river keepers were more like police. Um, so we formed our organization um, and as Dave said we became a 501c3 in Georgia and the IRS and all that. We can take your money and um, uh, use it for good works. In 2015, um, we thought that there seemed to be some name recognition with the Riverkeeper organization, that sort of Riverkeeper name, and uh, Waterkeeper International was taking on many more international rivers. Um, at, the, at the conference lately, I got one that says the Yellow River. That's really the Yellow River in China, the Yangtze. <laughs> Um, so there are international water keepers and river keepers now, and they're not necessarily about suing. They're not necessarily about being the police. They're more like us. They're more about um, advocacy and education. And so when the focus of Waterkeeper International changed a little bit, we said, now we're ready to affiliate. So we became an affiliate um, for the upper Swanee area, for the rivers in our area, and then all of a sudden we were becoming a member and taking on the Lower Swanee too. So we advocate um, and educate about the rivers in the Swanee Basin, um, and the Swanee Riverkeeper is one of our many programs. So this songwriting contest is one of our programs. The um, movie, the film festival we had last month, one of our programs. The race we had in April, one of our programs. We've had a program every month for the last uh, three months and we have an outing every month so the whole outings thing is uh, one of our programs. Programs don't happen 
for free. And nothing happens for free. Um, and as John said, we're a membership organization. We've been really trying hard not to take corporate money because if um, a corporation, say um, Nestle offered, they said, you know, we have a vested interest, interest in clean water because we take water out of the Madison Blue Spring. But if we took money from them and then they wanted to change their withdrawal permit, they might say, hey, and don't come to the hearing. We just don't want to take their money. Um, we want to take um, the voices of the people who live in the basin and amplify that through our education. So that's why we really need you. Um, it doesn't, what in my, so I'm the treasurer, by the way, um, and the membership person. In my mind, the perfect thing would be if you would give $5 a month. If you would get on our regular giving, we have a place on the website where you can go and become a regular donor. $5 a month is just $60 a year. Um, if we had a thousand people giving sixty dollars a year, that'd be sixty thousand dollars, and that'd be pretty close to being able to fund some of our bigger programs. Um, we do special fundraising, like he said, for the lawsuits. So we have a special fundraiser where all the money that comes in just goes to that thing. But in general, we need operational money. I don't know if you looked at the programs, but they got a little. Some of them have a little red streak along the bottom. That means the printer's running out of magenta. That means that we need to buy the toner cartridge. That means that $24 has to go somewhere. So uh, everything is uh, about money. You can't do anything without money. Um, please become a regular donor. At $10 a month, I would be like, I'd be super happy. Um, and that's how I changed my donating. I was you know, just writing a check once a year, and now I can feel like I can actually give more when I give a little bit every month. So um, please consider that. Um, I would send you back to our, I would stop talking and send you back to our room, but the judges are back there conferring in our little us auction room. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, nobody has a question. Okay, I'm done singing. They're coming back, yay. It was extremely difficult. <laughs> extremely difficult. These are awesome. Could we have another hand for our musicians, please? And our judges, who can make this extremely difficult because I'm telling you, if I was a a judge, and then I wrote down five, 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 they all did great. All wonderful songs. All very original, very